this is a continuation of a year-long class we've been doing on the philosophy of secular humanistic Judaism. It's actually based on a curriculum that's sold by the International Institute that has opening readings and uh, discussion questions and so on. And there's a facilitator's copy with some answers to those discussion questions. So if a local community is interested in doing it, they can do it on their own as well. We use it as a basis for our class. And for those of our uh, adult learners who want the chance to do reading and homework, they have an opportunity because there are suggestions for outside readings, other materials to draw on. Uh, the first part of the class, we did our basic philosophy, answering questions of ethics and uh, aesthetics and uh, values, politics, uh, how do we find out the truth, what's the nature of people. We're turning now to the second part of the class, which is more looking at the intellectual roots of our particular approach to Jewish life. Um, and the basic text for that is another book published by the Institute called Judaism in a Secular Age, which is an anthology of 50 thinkers, writers, intellectuals, uh, and literary artists, we'll put it that way, who uh, helped to lay the framework for our approach to Jewish life. Um, it ranges from well-known people like um, uh, David Ben-Gurion and Theodor Herzl um, and Albert Einstein to lesser known people who are known in our movement like Shimon Dubnov and Chaim Zhivlowski, whom we'll talk about today, as well as some of the founders and organizers of our approach to Jewish life in the third part of the book, the framers of our movement. Um, but if we're gonna talk about intellectual roots, we have to sort of define what we mean by that. Because we're not simply talking biological roots. You know, my, my biological roots go back to Eastern Europe on my mother's side, they go back to Syria on my father's side. You know, I can only go as far back as Ancestry.com will, you know, uncover with the DNA testing. Uh, but we're more interested in our intellectual roots, our ideological roots. And this anthology, Judaism in a Secular Age, was uh, put together in 1995. This was published then. The process began earlier, obviously. And they chose who they felt were the most important framers and intellectual precursors for our movement. It begins with Baruch Spinoza, who was perhaps the world's first secular person, although wh whether he would have considered himself Jewish is an interesting question, because for Spinoza, uh, Jewishness was about following the law, and he didn't feel the law applied to him because uh, the Jewish community had no political power. He followed the laws of the state, and so he might not have considered himself Jewish. He was secular in terms of his behavior in life. He didn't believe in a personal God that intervened in the world. So in some ways, he's a precursor, a, an opening salvo, so to speak, of a secular approach to life. But he didn't necessarily have a positive Jewish identity. And then the rest of the figures that you see in this book come out of either the Zionist world, the Yiddish cultural world, um, or other examples of post-Enlightenment thought, you know, uh, from the late 1700s forward. Um, and most of them are largely secular people, not 100% secular, Martin Buber's in there, for example, um, but it doesn't include any representatives from Reform Judaism. It doesn't include Moses, uh, Moses Mendelssohn or Moses Maimonides, for that matter, in a pre-modern setting. It doesn't include any rabbis from the Talmud or Jewish tradition. So the definition of roots is complicated because I would say that some of our roots come from that rabbinic tradition, but perhaps they're further back in our family tree, so they're harder to recognize as being similar to us. You know, if you think of it like an evolutionary tree, you have your furthest back ancestors who look very different from modern human beings, but they have some features in common. And then as you get further down the tree closer to modern times, you see they have increasingly more features in common that are more and more like us. Um, and then as you get to the most recent ancestors of modern Homo sapiens, you see a lot of features that are very similar. And they might even recognize us as belonging to their species if there was some kind of time travel experience. So this is the same when it comes to intellectual roots. When we read about people who lived a thousand years before us, even if they were interested in Greek philosophy or in living the good life with wine and women and song, as, as some of the medieval Spanish poets did, they're going to still look rather different from us because they're living a thousand years before we are. The closer roots that we would consider more direct ancestors would be the people living in the last 200 years, in the aftermath of the Enlightenment, the beginnings of emancipation, and the beginnings of possibilities of not just individual secular people, a la Spinoza, but actually secular Jewish communities where there's enough Jewish people who have become secularized but want to maintain some kind of Jewish identity that they begin to create an ideology, a philosophy, a 
of what their community and their approach is all about. That really is the beginnings of our close ancestry in the last 150 years. So today we're gonna to be looking at a group that is broadly called Yiddishists. Uh, next week we'll be talking about Zionists, and then we'll look at some other examples in May as we go through the rest of the uh, curriculum. So I just wanted to give you that overview of what we're talking about here when we're talking about Yiddish is it's not just the language, but it's really an ideology of creating a Judaism in it or a Jewishness, as we'll talk about the subtleties, um, that marks something different in Jewish history and a step in our direction in terms of our movement's ideology. So let me start by talking briefly about what Yiddish is. Not all of us might know as much, and there's always something more to learn. Many of us know individual words, usually the dirty ones or the annoyance ones, um, or we may even know a couple phrases here or there. Um, some who were raised in a more active Yiddish community or whose parents came over later, like in the 20s or 30s, maybe their grandparents came over, or some even came over after World War II, they have a more living Yiddish experience. For me, my great-grandparents were the ones who came over, and so my grandmother could understand Yiddish but didn't want to speak it. My mother went to a Yiddish supplementary school, and so she learned how to read Yiddish, sing Yiddish songs, and so on, but it was as a sort of secondary language, an after-school experience that she did because she was close with her grandparents, but not anything she grew up in the home speaking. So this break in uh, Yiddish continuity is something that we also have to think about. Yiddish is a Jewish language. It's written with Hebrew letters, but we use vowels as letters, where in Hebrew Hebrew, you have little dots and dashes and marks above and below the consonants that mark the vowel sounds. Um, in Yiddish, you have individual letters that stand for different vowel sounds, a ah and e and e and a is a different sound. And so they're written out by letters. And so a Yiddish book actually takes longer than a Hebrew book because of all the uh, letters being written out, both vowels and consonants. Yiddish begins around the year 1000 of the Common Era, it starts as an old high German, uh, which is, makes sense because Jews are living in the Rhine Valley at the time, and they're speaking German with their neighbors, but their alphabet that they write in is Hebrew, and so this is the beginnings of Yiddish. Now, what's interesting is that when they moved to Eastern Europe, the Jews did not pick up Slavic languages as a whole and start writing those in Hebrew letters. Instead, they kept their medieval German as they moved east. But as languages are fluid and flexible, it adapted new uh, language from around itself into the, uh, into the Yiddish language. So some terms in Yiddish come from German um, directly. Uh, ich gehe, I go. That sounds just like German, it's Yiddish as well. The numbers uh, are slightly different accented, but ein, zwei, drei, ein, zwei, drei in German, very similar. Um, about 10 to 15 percent of Yiddish language is from Slavic origin. So for example, you might know the Yiddish term for grandmother is bubby. But if you think about what Eastern European women wear on their head, it's called a babushka because Baba wears it. Baba's grandmother in Polish and in Russian and in other Slavic languages. So bubby as a Yiddish term comes from the Slavic term for grandmother. There are a few terms, maybe three to 5% of Yiddish terms that actually come from Latin. So for example, what you say when you do a blessing over a meal, you would say you're benching. Uh, to bench comes from the word benediction in Latin is blessing. Um, so benching in Yiddish has a Latin root, but most of the words are German, some Slavic, and of course, some Hebrew. So uh, a chocham is a sage from chacham in Hebrew, or uh, you can say the word sefer in uh, in Yiddish, and it means something coming from the Hebrew word sefer. But sometimes when you get multiple languages coming together, which word you use makes a difference. So there's actually a distinction in Yiddish between a buch and a sefer. Buch comes from German, it's more like an ordinary common book. But a sefer is a holy book, a book written in Hebrew for religious purposes, high status. So ironically, with two words that both mean volume printed when binding, um, they have different resonances. And actually, to use the word chocham in Yiddish, usually you would use it ironically. Oh, he thinks he's so smart, like a wise ass, right? Uh, that's a chocham, you know? Uh, 
and you might use another word for someone who really is a gadol hador, a, a, a genius of the generation. Um, and sometimes you'd even get words that start in Hebrew and then become Yiddish as a phrase. So the word in Hebrew for uh, the master of the house is Baal Habayit. In Yiddish, because the accent thing is slightly different and a T at the end becomes an S, like Shabbat becomes Shabbos. You might have heard the phrase good Shabbos in Yiddish. So the Baal Habayit becomes Balabos. Now, if you were doing a feminine form of that, like a woman who's in charge of the house, if you went back to the Hebrew, it would be Baalat Habayit. But what happens in the Yiddish is the phrase Balabos has become a phrase, so now it takes the Yiddish ending and becomes Balabusta. Or you may have heard the phrase a machatonin, the people you're related to because your kids married each other, from michutan in Hebrew. But your female machatan is a machatonista. Again, not going to the Hebrew version, taking a Yiddish ending. So this is how languages evolve, and this is how Yiddish has roots in Hebrew, but also is a distinct experience. In fact, in Yiddish, you would refer to Yiddish itself as the mamaloshan. Mamaloshan means mother tongue. It's what your mama speaks to you and what you speak to your mama. Hebrew in Yiddish was called the Loishen Koidish, or the holy language. And you had this phenomenon that Uriel Weinreich, the linguist, referred to as internal bilingualism, meaning you had two languages just for Jews for different purposes. Now, external bilingualism is very common. You speak Spanish at home, you speak English on the street. Okay. But for Jews, you had this internal bilingualism where they would use Slavic languages, Russian, Polish, whatever, on the street. And at home, they would use Yiddish in the house and Hebrew in the synagogue, or for elevated purposes. Yiddish was the mamaloshin, the women's language, uh, the home language, the domestic language, the ordinary life language, whereas Hebrew was the elevated language. This is why, by the way, in Israel today, you'll find neighborhoods where people are still speaking Yiddish, because they don't want to profane the holy language by saying, which bus do I take to get to the train station? You use the substitute language, the daily language of Mamaloshin, you save the Loishin Koitish, the holy language, for holy things. But that's an internal bilingualism experience and obviously a gendered difference. Um, the earliest examples of Yiddish literature that we have go back to the 1500s. There was a famous uh, sort of picaresque adventure novel by a, uh, about a man named Bovo, who it was called the Bovo Buch. Um, and Bova had lots of mice. He had lots of adventures, experiences. So if you ever heard of the phrase a Bova Misa, it doesn't mean a grandmother's story. It means a story of Bova, the hero of this original novel. But nowadays, everyone thinks a Bova Misa is just a grandma's story, and it's fanciful because grandma made it up. But that's not exactly where it comes from. The other famous example of Yiddish literature was published in 1590. It's called the Tsena Urena. It's a translation of the Hebrew Bible into Yiddish with a lot of rabbinic commentaries and, and other legends mixed into it. The most interesting thing about the Tsena Urena is what it said in the preface. It said, this book is for women and for men who are like women. What does that mean? It means men who can't read Hebrew. See, if you speak Yiddish every day and you know the Hebrew alphabet, you could read Yiddish. But if you speak Yiddish every day and you know the Hebrew alphabet, and can read Hebrew, then you're in a different level of learning. So when they said men who are like women, they didn't mean people who wore other clothing or anything else. What they meant was real men read Hebrew. <laughs> and yes, women can read Yiddish. And you can see in that kind of a language that Yiddish had a kind of secondary status in organized Jewish life, that it was the women's language, the home language, but not the language of prestige. So if that's the case for Yiddish, in pre-modern times, coming into the modern world, why would it be that some of the earliest secular Jews felt that they could build a secular Jewish identity around the language of Yiddish? We sometimes call these people Yiddishists because they believed in the power of Yiddish. Why could they make Yiddish into a core of a secular Jewish identity? Well, the number one advantage that they had was it's a language that everybody spoke in Eastern Europe and that most people could read because most men had learned to read uh, the alphabet drilled into them. And even most women had learned at least the alphabet and could read this Yiddish literature. Um, so it was, a, it was a language people already knew. Instead of trying to teach them Hebrew or German or some other language they didn't know, 
why not start with where they are? Well, that's a good place to start when you're talking about a, uh, a mass appeal movement. Um, in fact, mass appeal was part of the agenda of many Yiddishists. They tended to be on the left politically, as many Jews were at the time. Um, and their goal was that they wanted the rights for Jews living in the Russian Empire, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and in other parts of the world to have what they called cultural autonomy. Now, what that meant was not that they would have a political separate entity because they knew the Russian Empire was not going to give them land and the Austro-Hungarian Empire was not going to carve out a Jewish state somewhere in Eastern Europe. Instead, what they wanted was like the rights of other ethnic minorities in these multi-ethnic empires. They wanted the right to use their language in dealing with the government. They wanted their right to be able to run theaters and plays and publish newspapers and books and run schools and teach their children the language in a formal way with government sponsorship and support. It was a, an attempt at multiculturalism in the context of a multicultural empire like the Russian Empire or the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So their goal was getting this, what they would have called a national right, we might call ethnic rights, to use their own language and culture and celebrate it that way. Um, also, if you're a more secular Jew, you're more focused on this world and on the needs of everyday people. And the language you speak every day is a this world experience. Also, one of the challenges that the Yiddishes faced was they did not want to vanish and assimilate into general society. There were other Jews that did like that idea, that wanted you to learn German and be, as they say, a, a man on the street and a Jew in your tent. Keep your Jewishness private. That wasn't the Yiddishist approach. They wanted you to be a proud Jew out there in the street as well, be, being willing to speak a Jewish language out there as well. So they wanted to find ways that would keep you distinctly Jewish. And Yiddish, especially in the Eastern European experience, was only spoken by Jews. In fact, about 15 years ago, there was a major debate at a uh, college campus because uh, the head of the Yiddish department who had been hired was not Jewish at a university. And on one level, if Yiddish is an academic subject and people can study it as undergraduates and get master's degrees and PhDs in it, then the ethnic identity of the person who happens to be the chair of the Yiddish department shouldn't matter. On the other hand, you can ask the same questions about African American studies, Chinese, Amer Chinese studies, um, all kinds of ethnic studies departments where the identity of the scholar also matters, not just the subject matter. Um, and Yiddish, for most of Jewish history, was a province only of Jews. They were the only ones who read it. They were the only ones who spoke it in any great detail. And so if you were creating a distinct Jewish identity built around Yiddish, it was automatically Jewish because of the language you used and the references you mentioned. And the day for Saturday was Shabbos. You didn't have a word for Saturday. It was always Shabbos or Shabbat. So it was automatically a Jewish experience and a Jewish cultural expression. And for many, there was a kind of emotional resonance to this. It wasn't just that it was an abstract language of Jewishness that they were learning, like they would have been learning Hebrew as a daily language. Instead, it was a deeply personal experience. It's what they grew up, it was their mama lotion, what they literally spoke to their mothers. And most importantly, for these Yiddishists, speaking Yiddish or learning Yiddish culture or reading Yiddish books, was not belief dependent. It didn't matter what you believed to experience Yiddish culture. They described their ideology as Weltlich, as secular. But Weltlich in Yiddish really means cosmopolitan, worldly, like universal. They were citizens of the world. And they described their sense of Jewishness not as Judaism, as we might say it, but they used the word Yiddishkeit in Yiddish, which means Jewishness. It was a quality of being. It was who they were by birth and ethnic identity. And so what you believed didn't matter. You could have a range of perspectives. But if you were part of a Yiddish community that defined itself as secular, it left religion as a private discussion. You believe in God or not, that's up to you. But what we do here is a non-religious, secular public square kind of ethnic Jewishness based on Yiddish language. And we can run schools that teach Yiddish and sing Yiddish songs and do Yiddish plays and uh, learn Yiddish stories and learn to speak Yiddish to their grandparents, that can be the basis for a youth education program. So this idea of a secular Yiddishist identity was a very popular one for secularized Jews who wanted some kind of positive Jewish connection. Chaim Jedlowski was a Polish uh, and Russian Jewish intellectual, but he also was very active in America, encouraging people 
to connect to their Jewishness in a secular and especially Yiddish focused way. He points out that uh, religion was the chief weapon in our struggle for a separate existence as a national minority, but it was not religion that made us a people. We created the Jewish religion. Judaism exists by virtue of the existence of the Jews. We elevated religion as a national duty because religion had the power to maintain us. In these times, religion is being transformed into a private matter of individuals alone. Every individual has the right to believe as he, we would say, or she wishes. And so now we have this secular national character of America that we find uh, more powerful. In fact, religion is no longer the factor that unites the Jews. What does is this ethnic experience, this national minority existence. And he says in the, in the latter part of this citation, we contend that our national cultural existence in America will be built on the foundation of the Yiddish language. Through Yiddish, we preserve all the significant treasures of our universal culture, as well as our own rich Hebrew heritage. We will educate our children in this language. We will establish our own educational institutions from elementary schools to universities. And so we need a power that can bind all Jews into one entity while allowing freedom of decisions, beliefs. The power must be spiritual, that is emotional. And such a spiritual power can only be the Yiddish language. Hence, our people in America will build its national future on the basis of this language. So that was his hope, to build this kind of cultural autonomy world in America, not only in Russia. Now, another major thinker of this period was Shimon Dubnov. Actually, his brother was a Zionist and moved to Israel, but Dubnov stayed in the diaspora, and he said that the Jews have always been a nation, a separate community, based on its own ideology and, more importantly, its national experience. Now he says, if we wish to preserve Judaism as a cultural historical type of nation, we must realize the religion of Judaism is one of the integral foundations of national culture, and anyone who seeks to destroy it undermines the basis of national existence. The Orthodox Jews recognize a traditional Judaism set from the beginning, but we believe in an evolutionary Judaism in which new and old forms are always being assumed or discarded and adjusts itself to new conditions. Their concern is holiness, ours is creative freedom. Historical Judaism is not merely a religion. Judaism is a body of culture. Unique historical conditions brought the life of the Jewish nation under the dominance of religion. In each of these areas, history is piled layer upon layer, and Judaism is broad enough to draw from its source according to one's spirit and the outlook. The core ideology for Dubnov, for the cultural autonomous, for the Yiddishists, was what was called doikait. Doikait means hereness. If we have Jewish problems, if we feel oppressed, if we need the way to, a way to articulate our culture meaningfully and keep Jews Jewish, let's do it here. Let's do it now. Let's do it with the language they already speak. Don't try to teach them Hebrew. Don't try to teach them English or German. Let's build on what they have as the basis for their Jewish experience and their Jewish identity and connection. Uh, now, sometimes you got people critiquing the Yiddishists, they said that uh, they want everything Zionists want, which is a national state, a national culture, but they have seasickness, so they don't actually want to go to Palestine. Uh, that was the, the joke about the Yiddishists. Um, in the end, though, their claim was, we're not in exile. We don't belong somewhere else. We belong here. We are a diaspora, a spreading of seeds that takes roots where we are. So it was a diaspora positive approach that said there could be a future for Jewish life outside of its own political territory built around the cultural palace of the Yiddish language. That was the essence of this Yiddishist approach. Now, this seems kind of odd to us today who are not speaking Yiddish, and many of us don't know Yiddish, and to think, did they really think that was gonna work? But in a certain time and place, in fact, in a few times and places, it was a very plausible approach. If you were living in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, or in Poland, or in uh, Russia, in 1920, you could have traveled just about anywhere in the Jewish world outside of the Middle East and gotten around just fine in Yiddish. No problem. Um, there were Jews speaking Yiddish all over the world, in, and thousands of them, and teaching their kids Yiddish too in Yiddish supplementary schools. In 1934, just to give you one example, there were 20,000 Jewish kids in America, in, in uh, the United States, receiving a Yiddish secular education of some variety of political orientation. 
10% of the Jews getting a Jewish education were getting it in Yiddish at one of these schools in 1934. This is a huge proportion of the Jewish community. And if you were living in the Soviet Union in the 1920s, they actually had departments of the government called Yevsekzia, or Jewish sections, whose job was to sponsor Yiddish language theater and Yiddish publications and Yiddish schools and Yiddish textbooks and Yiddish poets. So you could totally imagine a context where Yiddish language could be the core of a Jewish experience moving forward. The joke in Israel was that everyone spoke Hebrew in the university and Yiddish on the street. Nowadays, of course, it's the opposite. In the secular world, the Yiddishists are in the university and everyone on the street is speaking Hebrew. Uh, times change. We'll talk about that change too. So you could have imagined a world where this was a very plausible context. So let me share with you again some examples of this, uh, this experience. You can see this picture. These are a series of protesters uh, advocating for unionization. You see it in multiple languages. You can see in the background English. You can see uh, Russian in the Cyrillic alphabet. But you also see this wonderful picture in, in English, Italian, and in Yiddish, in union is our strength. Uh, and this is an example of how the, the leftist experience was both international and particular because of all the different ethnic groups that had their own uh, uh, ethnic linguistic representation. Jews were very active in the labor movement in that early period. There were many, many of them poor immigrants working in sweatshops and factories. And so they became very involved in leftist politics as well. Um, just to give you one other example of this abiding interest, I mean, this is, you can tell by the dress and the hats in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Here's a list from 1947 of the different language sections of the International Workers' Order, which is the Communist Party. I mean, we're not going to beat around the bush here. There were other labor groups. The IWO was basically the communists. And uh, so these are the 15 unified language sections of the Internationalen Arbeiterorden, or IWO, International Workers' Order. The number one group, by far the largest at 56,000, is Yiddishar, <laughs> the Yiddish speaking, the Yiddish folks order, the Yiddish people's order. In fact, in, in Canada, even today, there's a group called the United Jewish People's Order, which is a descendant of this particular organization. So you, you can see 56,000, larger than any two groups put together, are represented by Yiddish speakers. And this is in 1947. This is after World War II. This is after the American immigration laws changed in the 1920s to close the doors to Eastern European immigrants. So many of these are either second generation speakers or people who've been speaking Yiddish for 30 years after living in America. The general section of the English speakers is 21,000 and probably a chunk of those were, uh, Yiddish, were uh, Jewish as well. Uh, you also have the Ukrainian speakers, the Russian speakers, some of them might have been Jewish too, Slovakian, and so on, all the way down the list. So what's amazing is that so many of the Jews, even in 1947, post-war McCarthy period, I mean, it's beginning to get tough to be a communist, still the large number of uh, participants are Jews. Um, so this is a world where the leftist political activism, you could imagine, being uh, in a world where you could be Yiddish speaking and participate all across the world in a variety of uh, public and cultural experiences. Um, there were Yiddish newspapers being published daily. In New York City in 1915, there were five daily Yiddish papers with a combined readership of around 500,000 people. If you were a Yiddish public intellectual, you would go on the speaking circuit, you know, selling books and ideas and you could go to any town just about in America with a Jewish population and find a Yiddish speaking group to speak to. There were Yiddish supplementary schools in Podunk, Indiana that I'd never heard of. But in fact, if there were enough Jews there, they made a Yiddish school for the kids to be able to learn some Yiddish. Um, you would have novels serialized and short stories serialized in newspapers. Just as one example, there was a series of stories written by the famous Yiddish writer Shalom Aleichem, about a character named Tevye Del Milchiger. Tevye Del Milchiger, we know now as Tevye from Fiddler on the Roof. But I have to tell you, in the original Shalom Aleichem stories, there's no fiddle <laughs> and there's no fiddler. That actually comes from the paintings of um, uh, Marc Chagall, where he has a fiddler floating and a fiddler on the roof. But 
That's where the concept of the fiddler on the roof comes from. It's nowhere in the Sholem Aleichem stories. But these stories were written episodically over the period of 15 years. And so some of them think he has five daughters and some of them think he has seven daughters. It doesn't always agree between the stories. And there are a lot more gritty and class conflict oriented and sad than, than you'll find in, uh, in the Broadway version done in the 1960s. It's a whole in, another interesting debate about the, the evolution of Tevye from Shalom Aleichem's version in the 1910s to the 1960s, everything's all right in America version in Fiddler on the Roof. Um, but Yiddish literature was a, a really core part of this cultural experience because after all, if you're a nation, you have national literature. In fact, you even translate stuff into your language. There was a huge project to translate the works of Western literature into Yiddish. The famous story is that when they put on a production of the Yiddish King Lear at the Yiddish, uh, main Yiddish theater in New York, and of course, what better Shakespeare to translate into Yiddish than, oh, sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child. They don't call, they don't write, they never visit, you know, that, uh, that classic Yiddish grandma complaint. Um, so they put King Lear into Yiddish, they performed it, and after the play, everyone's in a standing applause calling out, author, author. They might not have gotten it. <laughs> this wasn't an original Yiddish composition, this was uh, Shakespeare, translated. Um, so this is just one example of this national cultural identity, the expression of uh, Yiddish language. Um, here's another one, uh, examples of poetry. So here you get a flavor of both the Yiddish language and the politics. This is called To a Woman Socialist, To a Socialisti. Your eyes glisten, glow, and sparkle when you talk of times to come, when humanity is equal and the bad old order's gone. I believe in your great vision, still the tears in my eyes shine, for even in the best new order, darling, you will not be mine. So as much as he's swept up with the historical sweep of revolution, he still laments the fact that she dumped him <laughs> and he can't date her anymore. Um, or some of them are very personalized. This piece called Night by uh, Yankov Glashstein, who writes in the 1930s, um, is talking about how you respond to fear and build on that. Uh, here's another one. This is by a Soviet Yiddish poet called Itzik Pfeffer. So what if I've been circumcised with rituals as among the Jews? Field winds have tanned my middle-sized pale dreaming feet to darker hues. Some Jews long for cholent yet, it was a special dish made on Shabbat. We tufts for smoke and flame in motion. Eight years embattled meadows set underneath the sky's blue ocean. I'm a quiet guy and hardly a villain. My honesty has no great appeal. I'm never known to put on to fill in. I'm never known to wheel and deal. It's even assimilating some of the anti-Semitic stereotypes of Jews. So what if I've been circumcised with rituals as among the Jews? Field winds have tanned my middle-sized pale dreaming feet to darker hues. I'll just point out in the Hebrew, it's in, uh, I'm sorry, in the Yiddish, the Hebrew letters, um, he uses the word gemolot from milah, which is the word for circumcision in Hebrew, but it's an example of that translation. And he says, um, abris. I had by the Jews a bris, a circumcision. Again, the Hebrew term brit morphed into Yiddish uh, language. So this is a more universalist poem using Jewish echoes and rituals and past, but saying, eh, I'm not only Jewish, I'm not defined by the past, I'm defined by what I do in life, that I went out in the fields and I got tanned and I fought, right? That's a very different kind of uh, model of Jewishness. Now, some of the, the music that was produced in this period has an intentional kind of schmaltzy quality to it. So I wanna show you an example of, um, one of these, this is a song that we sing in my community periodically. It's called Oifen Pripachuk. And um, it's, uh, I'll tell you why it's schmaltzy in a minute. <laughs> Such 
Gedenkt Schatayere, wo's ihr lernt doch. Sagt schon noch einmal und gar kein noch einmal. Komm jetzt alle vor. Sagt schon noch einmal und gar kein noch einmal. Komm jetzt alle vor. flavor there of the, um, the the nostalgia for Yiddish, the emotional connection. This was written in 1905 in New York for the Yiddish theater. It was intentionally schmaltzy and emotionally evocative and reminding you of the old country and the rabbi teaching the kids the olive bay. The, the old cheder where these kids had learned was a terrible learning environment. The pedagogy was rote repetition. There was corporal punishment for kids who weren't quiet. I mean, it was not this idealized, you know, warm hearth with the rabbi gathering the kids around and saying, listen, dear ones, you need to learn these. Like, that wasn't the setting. But it's, it's that nostalgia for the old country and the old world and so on. It was done intentionally schmaltzy. Um, another great example of Yiddish music from this period is the song By Mir Bis to Shane, which is written by Sholem Sekunda, originally in Yiddish. And it goes not very far. He sells the rights to it for maybe 25 bucks to a record company. And then they translate the, a few lines, most of it into English and a couple lines into German. And it's sung by the very non-Jewish Andrews sisters. And now by Mir Bis Duchesne becomes a world success of the song. But in the Yiddish version, it didn't go very far because it had a limited audience. The melody was catchy. Um, so, I mean, the most important institution of this Yiddishist approach were these Yiddish language schools and camps that I mentioned. So let me share with you just one example of uh, an image out of those camps. So I love these uh, examples. These are uh, pictures from the Yiddish school movement. On the left, you'll see rehearsals for a Purim play. And you see the kids are all dressed up in costume and you've got the teacher with the script cueing them on their lines and they built their own. I mean, this is the 1920s. They're putting a lot of energy into making this a meaningful uh, production for the kids. In the middle, you see an example of a youth journal. In fact, a lot of these youth movements in schools, there were enough of them, they published youth journals. If you got 20,000 kids in a school system, they might have an uh, appetite for, uh, you know, youth literature and so on. But I love the, the uh, decoration here. It says Kinder, it's the name of the journal, Mir Lernen und Kämpfen, we learn and we struggle, like the workers, right? Um, but if you know the Hebrew at all, if you look closely at the font, the letters all look like hammers and sickles. <laughs> because this was from one of those international workers order uh, communist uh, organizations. And then my favorite of these pictures is on the right, where you have these young girls in a, a white dresses. And if you read the Yiddish inscription in the corner, it's from a workman circle camp, which was a socialist Jewish summer camp. It says, a Troyertanz, a morning dance, on the second yard site, anniversary of a death, for Sacco and Vanzetti, who are two Italian anarchists who were killed by the, uh, the US justice system. Um, and so what I love about this is you get the Jewishness because it's a yard site, it's the anniversary of a death, but you get the radical socialism because they're mourning Sacco and Vanzetti, who had nothing to do with being Jewish, but were totally part of the leftist political world, and they're doing this funky kind of mourning dance, and you can tell they're secular because you can see their knees and their legs. This is not an orthodox, uh, Jewish setting. So this is the world of these camps, these, uh, this cultural expression. And I'll share one last uh, example of a text with you. This is something that my mother actually learned growing up. Um, she uh, was part of one of the Yiddish speaking schools, as I mentioned, her grandfather helped to found it in Detroit. Um, and this is a song they would sing on Passover and other major holidays, lighting candles. Um, and it, it went something like this. Mir benchen die Licht, mir benchen die Licht, lechove dem heiligen Yom Tov. 
Atog fun ba frying fun freid und gesang, sing kid in sein und afog, and so on. And so you, you see in the translation, we bless the lights in honor of the holy holiday, a day with freedom, with joy, singing Jews are a nation. Uh, we, the flame from the light should light all Israel forever and ever. Let us sing in gratitude for the great day. You'll notice what's missing there. No God. And who's doing the blessings? We bless the light. Traditionally, you bless God who does these things. In this case, we bless the light. So that's, again, an example of that creative culture where Dubnov said we're talking about creativity, not just keeping tradition the same. Now, this Yiddish-speaking world is no longer as active as it used to be. Um, and so that's why the Yiddishist idea seems very foreign to us now, focusing on Yiddish language as the focus. Well, what caused the decline? Number one, two, and three cause for the decline is the Holocaust. Because the Holocaust wiped out six million Jews in Europe, the vast majority of whom were Yiddish speakers. And so when you lose four million of the eight million Yiddish speakers in the world, that's a body blow to a language. Plus, Eastern Europe was the heartland where you had Yiddish being spoken at the home, in the school, in, in print, in politics. There were Yiddish-speaking political parties in Poland. Um, I mean, this was a real Yiddish land, a Yiddish territory. Um, in fact, there's an, uh, an amusing uh, book you may have heard of called The Yiddish Policeman's Union, um, which imagines what happened if they took all those Eastern European Jews and transplanted them to Alaska. Um, and the novel was actually created because the author, Michael Shabon, found a book um, on a used bookshelf called Say It in Yiddish. And how do you say, where's the police station? And how do I order a, a glass of wine? In Yiddish. But it was published in 1965. And he said, where would they possibly need this book in 1965? How to say it in Yiddish. And so then he imagined, well, what if, in fact, this proposal had been proposed to move millions of Eastern European Jews into Alaska, what if that had actually happened? And you had a Yiddish speaking, largely secular, uh, but a mixed uh, bag community there. And that's where the conceit for the novel came from. Um, but the Holocaust wiped out millions of Yiddish speaking Jews. And that was, a, that was a total killer for the language. In America, um, the immigration restrictions I mentioned cut off the flow of new immigrants fluent in the language. Um, there were also a series of political splits in the leftist movement after the Russian Revolution, and in the Red Scare of the 1920s, and in the McCarthy Scare of the 1950s, where the socialist political orientation became a liability for doing Yiddish and having these Yiddish communities. So where you had 20,000 Jews getting a Yiddish education in the 1930s, by the 1950s, 12 schools would collapse into one in Chicago, as one example. So it was a radical change because people wanted nothing to do with anything that could be labeled as socialist. In the Soviet Union, Stalin cracked down on the Yevsexia, closed the schools, closed the libraries, closed the theaters, arrested the poets, killed a lot of them in 1947, uh, and, and Yiddish life in, in the Soviet Union was largely crushed as well. Um, and then there's the benign effects of living in a Western culture that's largely tolerant. You know, you grew up, let's say, a Yiddish-speaking factory worker, okay, in 1910, 1920. Do you want your kids to join the union and go to work in the factory? No. You want your kids to get an education, to get a profession, become a pharmacist, own a grocery store. And when you were a pharmacist or ran a grocery store, did you want your kids to become a pharmacist? No, you wanted them to go to college and become a lawyer or a doctor or some other kind of white collar profession. Well, when that happens, A, you begin to lose your distinctive immigrant language, which happens across the board in America, languages fade when you go down generations. And secondly, you lose, you lose your socialist sympathies because when you're a doctor and you've got a suburban house with two cars in the garage, do you really want a social revolution to upend everything? Well, maybe not so much anymore. Uh, it's a lot easier when you're younger and poorer than when you're older and have assets. So um, the, the whole phenomenon of American acculturation, integration, and Jewish success in post-war America led to a decline in the attachment to Yiddish language and Yiddish as a basis for Jewish identity. And frankly, I mean, you might have already deduced this, um, not all Jews in the world speak Yiddish. <laughs> I mean, there are plenty of Jews who live in the Middle East, for example, who speak Arabic or who spoke Ladino, which is a medieval Spanish written in Hebrew letters. There were German Jews who had left Yiddish behind 100 years before. There are Israeli Jews today who speak Hebrew but not Yiddish. There are Russians who 
after, uh, after the killing of the Evsetsia, learned Russian and spoke Russian all the time. Uh, there are Ethiopian Jews who never knew yet. I mean, most of the world's Jews today don't speak Yiddish. So saying this was a universal Jewish language, the building block of Jewish culture was very, what we say today, Ashkenormative. It was focused on Ashkenazi Jews as if they defined everything. Now, there are still positive Yiddish connections today. We can think of American Jewish foods. Uh, sometimes uh, Yiddish is sort of a secret language. Uh, you may remember uh, this particular scene from the, uh, uh, a uh, movie by Mel Brooks. Let's close this window. Okay, so this is from Blazing Saddles. Came out in 1994. <laughs> No, no, it's like Mishma Sugar. Laws in gain! Kappa walk, it's all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, uh, big is in. Take off. Has big as in and then a lady? They darker than us. Woof. Okay, so hopefully you got the Yiddish there. Um, first he says they're black, Schwarze. Um, and then he says, um, los im gain, let them go. Um, and in the end, uh, you know, oh, seid this mit sugar, don't be crazy, you know, by attacking them. And then in the end, he says, hast du gesehen, have you ever seen that in your whole life? In ganzen Leben? Now, my mother tells me uh, that when she saw this film in the theater, you could tell where the Jews were sitting in the audience because you'd hear laughter to hear the Indians speaking Yiddish, but the general American population had no idea what, was, what the joke was there. So Yiddish sometimes has that secret language quality to it. The other major advantage that Yiddish has today is there's been a kind of Yiddish revival, whether it's university uh, departments of Yiddish speaking or most famously, uh, the Klezmer music revival, which has also led to people starting to learn Yiddish, sing in Yiddish, and in some cases speak Yiddish. There are summer Yiddish intensive programs that get dozens of people. Now, it's not thousands of people, but it, are, it is people learning. So I'm going to play you a, a short piece by um, the Klezmatics. It's a uh, song called Apikorsim, or Heretics. But you can hear the Klezmer music and you can hear the Yiddish. Can't even me, 
Das ist auch voll im Nahr, ich will dich kennen, ich trage ich in dem Sitz. Als nicht gewähnt, nicht du in Kämo, wird nicht sein. Du, wenn ich reise, meine schöne kleine, süße, feine, ständig bist. Mehr will in Kirchen sich und weiter trinken Wein. Lissige Apikus und tanzen nie in Aru. Lissige Apikus und rachen nie, ich bin Gott. Lissige Apikus und nennen sie Garin. Lissige Apikus. Zum Singen mit Sabrim Azir ist schön, Azir ist das Stück und Chazer So leicht rinnen, als wir der der Kur Tam kann eben nicht der Tamp in Eulen Hazer Liebe ist der listigste Rapport Schicke der Apikos und tanzen hier in Aron Rede der Apikos und bleiben nicht in Gott Jacke der Apikos und nehmen sie gerade So it's a fun song, right? Gives you a flavor of that Yiddish world. Is it a full national ethnic identity like they were talking about a hundred years ago? Well, not really, you know? It's something there, there's elements of an ethnic culture, but it's not an all-consuming identity. And is it enough for people to connect with and stay Jewish? So when I think about the legacy of Yiddishism for modern secular humanistic Judaism, I think about the importance of focusing on language and on literacy and on literature. You know, we still sing Oif and Pripachuk, we still teach some Yiddish uh, language to our kids in the Sunday school, some book, vocabulary here and there. Um, but also the very concept of literature as culture is important. After all, the very idea that doing Jewish is more than just prayer and Torah and synagogue and tradition, that was a core ideology of the Yiddishists because they weren't going to synagogue, they weren't going to pray but they were feeling very actively Jewish and they found other ways to do Jewish. It could be singing songs, putting on plays, running summer camps, doing a yard site for Sacco and Vanzetti. It was all in a Jewish key when they were celebrating these, uh, the, the intersection of their ideology and their um, ethnic identity and culture. And most importantly, they celebrated the idea of an evolving and creative Jewish culture. They wrote these plays. They wrote these klezmer songs. They wrote those stories set in the old country, set in a religious world, 
but articulating new and modern ideas. So I find the Yiddishist to be a very creative moment in Jewish history that is a direct evolutionary ancestor to what we do, if for no other reason than they, like we, see a future for Jews living outside of a Jewish territory. It needs to be based on cultural identity, on family history. For us, we don't necessarily agree it has to be a Jewish language, although language helps. What we share, though, is the idea of doikite. We can do our Jewishness here, where we are, in the world that we live, with our lifestyle as it is, and that, we believe, will be enough. Of course, time will tell, um, and we're optimistic as more and more Jews become secularized and identify their Jewishness as a cultural identity, that they'll also take these lessons from the Yiddishists that an evolving creative Jewish culture is perhaps the most meaningful.